Os alertas da ONU sobre aquecimento da Terra são otimistas demais. O planeta, como o conhecemos, está mudando e parte dos seres humanos que o habitam não conseguirá sobreviver. Combater o problema com redução nas emissões de carbono, extraindo energia de vento, maré ou biocombustíveis, seria perda de tempo. Uma das poucas medidas que ainda vale a pena tomar para salvar parte da raça humana é apelar para a energia nuclear. Esse diagnóstico controvertido e catastrófico não vem de grupos místicos à espera do fim do mundo ou de extremistas ecológicos em busca de apoio para suas campanhas. Quem o apresenta é o respeitado cientista britânico James Lovelock, considerado um dos grandes, se não o maior dos ambientalistas. Ele é, por certo, um dos pioneiros, porque há quase meio século criou o conceito de Gaia, que vê a Terra como um organismo vivo que se autorregula. Lovelock, em breve, vai completar 90 anos. Ele acaba de lançar mais um livro que se junta a 200 trabalhos científicos sobre meio ambiente. Lovelock nos recebeu para uma conversa em sua casa em Cornwall, sudoeste da Inglaterra. Your new book, The Vanishing Face of Gaia, suggests that it may actually be too late to save the Earth. Why do you think it's, it, we've gotten to this point? Isn't it? Well, if you look back at the Earth's history, it tends to be comfortable in one or two states, either cold, a glaciation, uh, ice age, or quite hot, about five degrees hotter than now. And in those states, it stays stable for periods as long as hundreds of thousands of years. The interglacial, like now, is an unstable state from which the Earth tends to move quite quickly in either one way or another. I think what we have done is precipitating a move towards the hot state. How much hotter? Five degrees Celsius globally. Five degrees is just the average when you talk about the whole, for the whole a few places would be quite yes. a lot more than that. Yes. The, the overall forecast that we hear, and, and scary enough, talk about 2%, uh, like the IPCC from the United Nations. But do you think they're underestimating it? I think th there are two reasons for their underestimate. One is their, the models on which they base their estimates of the future climate are really what you might call sophisticated weather forecast models. And they're not bad, they're, be they're good science, good, well, well established, but we don't know enough yet about the behavior of the whole Earth system to make models that are truly predictive. And so what they're suggesting, I wouldn't call it guesswork, but it's not as reliable as it should be. And the proof of that is that the forecast they made of this year, uh, 10 years ago, shall we say, are very badly wrong they underestimated the rate at which the sea level is rising by nearly 100%. And uh, they even more failed to estimate the rate at which the Arctic floating ice is melting away. That is vanishing quite rapidly. What other consequences such as those would be very grave happening with the five degrees rise of temperature as you're expecting? Well, well, for people in Brazil, they should worry because uh, Some quite good uh, scientific estimates suggest that considerably lower than five degree rise will be enough to destabilize the Amazon forest uh, altogether and cause it to revert to kind of savanna, scrub, desert, that kind of thing. And you think that is going to happen? I wouldn't say it's going to happen, but it, it's, it's on the cards. It's a probability. A high uh, probability, you think? Yes. In this overall loss of life that would result from that, how much biodiversity would be affected? What, what would be destroyed? What would survive other than the cockroaches of folklore that always survive? I, I, I think that, that that's a grave uh, exaggeration of what will happen. You see, looking back again at the Earth's history, what we see is 55 million years ago, there was an event very similar to the one now there was an enormous amount of carbon dioxide went into the atmosphere as the result of a geological accident, not people. But it amounted to the same thing. And up shot the temperature about five degrees Celsius. 
the polar ocean became so warm that tropical animals lived there. The, the water temperature was 23 Celsius. We have good records of that. And there were animals like crocodiles swimming around in the, near the North Pole. So what we're talking about is a shift, not necessarily a destruction That's right. of species. Yes. Uh, they move to other areas. But don't you expect that perhaps a substantial amount of uh, life will disappear altogether because they won't be able bound to put to, Bound to, but it'll diversify also. You see, those regions where the tropical forest moves up to uh, could become quite biodiverse, provided they're not, the forest isn't all taken down to have farmland to feed people. But what we're going to face is a kind of a Darwinian process of adapting to a different environment. Adapting is what we have to do. We have to accept that the climate is changing, whatever we do, and not spend all our efforts trying to stop it changing, uh, but try to work out how best to adapt with a minimum damage to human, to civilization, to people. You, you point out in your book that you think uh, population growth has been uh, a substantial uh, cause not a cause of contributing factor in this problem. I'm sure, yes, I do indeed, and I'm not alone in thinking that. If you go back, the, you know, know of Malthus, presumably. I mean, he, he was the first to warn that growing population were, could lead to unpleasant consequences. But that was 200 years ago, around about 1800, and there were about a billion people on the Earth then. And the ironic thing is, everybody poo-pooed Malthus' warning and said, oh, no, it's rubbish, we can cope with it, no problem. And we managed for 200 years. But uh, the, the payoff is now coming. I think Malthus was right. About a billion is about the right carrying capacity for uh, people on the Earth. If we look at this picture you're painting, is there a way to fight back? As there might just be. I'm not sure it would be the best thing to do, but there is one single way, scientifically, by which you could bring the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere down to the levels it was before industry started. 